Well, morning, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to Redeemer. I'm the pastor, Will. And just before I go any further, I want to start by paying special tribute to Redeemer's doctors, nurses, and other health workers. We have quite a few. You know who you are. And every time I look at the headlines about the NHS and coronavirus, I was listening to it on the news just now. It makes me so proud of you and it fuels my respect for you. And I know the same is true of the rest of the staff team and the elders and the whole church. You know, we're all under pressure in different ways in this crazy world, but I'm so conscious of the unique pressures that you're under and by all accounts, just dealing with magnificently. And so I, I want you to know that as a church, we're thinking of you and we love you and we're praying for you. Thank you. Well, after our Christmas series and then Vision Sunday last Sunday, uh, we're now picking back up in our series in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to have the reading in a second. Just before we do, here's a quick recap. So in around March of 50 AD, the Apostle Paul arrives in Corinth and he starts witnessing. And over the course of the next 18 months, he plants a church. And you can read all about it in Acts 18. It's an amazing story. And once this church is up and running with some momentum, he then continues on his missionary journey and ends up in Ephesus for a bit. But while he's there, he gets a report from the Corinthians indicating they are not happy with a letter he'd just written to them earlier about of their totally out of control sexual immorality. On top of that, he then also gets a message, gets word from a family in this uh, church, Chloe and her people, that the church is plagued with other big problems. And at this point, he also gets another letter from them indicating massive confusion, theological confusion on various issues, including marriage, including whether or not they can eat meat, which has been sacrificed to idols, huge cultural issue uh, for them, um, confusion about how to do church, Sunday gatherings, and confusion about the resurrection. So it's pretty safe to say this church in Corinth is one big fat mess. And yet they're so close to Paul's heart and he loves them. His heart aches for them. And so he sits down and writes what we have in front of us this morning as the letter of 1 Corinthians. Now, the section we're coming to now is about marriage and singleness. And in this section, as well as in all the others, Paul does the same thing. Very simply, number one, he defines the problem. And number two, he then answers it by applying to it a particular aspect of the gospel. So the letter is effectively, the whole letter is effectively all about learning to view everything in life through the lens of the gospel. You know, in any situation in life, the gospel's the answer. What's the problem? Um, I hope you parents out there read the email on Friday about the first part of this message just coming up after the reading, carrying a PG rating as we think about marriage and sex. Um, there won't be anything explicit. Um, I would personally encourage you to very much have your children listen in, pretty much uh, no matter what their age. But, um, you know, that, that is your call and, and I'd encourage you as well just to be judicious about that. We will be thinking in detail about sex within marriage. Um, anyway, I hope all of that context makes sense and helps orientate us as we jump back in. We'll now have the reading. Uh, I always think a real Bible is best, but failing that, do use the Bible function on the live chat. And the question for each of us to be answering during the reading now is this. Reading between the lines of what Paul says, what do you think was the single biggest mistake the Corinthians were making in how they thought about marriage? Reading between the lines in, in what Paul says, what do you think was the single one biggest mistake the Corinthians were making when they thought about marriage and singleness too? Let's have the reading. Hi, I'm Wesley. And today we're reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 1 to 16. Now concerning the matters about which he wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. <laughs> 
Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to, to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. But how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Loving Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us very powerfully through it now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, you've probably heard the old joke about how marriage isn't a word, it's a sentence. Um, or the one about the wife who said, My husband cooks for me every evening like I'm a god. He places burnt offerings before me. It's easy to be down on marriage, isn't it? Marriages get a hard rap, and marriages can be painful for sure. I mean, just look at this country's divorce rate of nearly 50%. In fact, just two months ago, the Office for National Statistics, ONS, reported that the, that the highest percentage increase in divorce in 50 years. And the most common reason given for those getting divorced, adultery. So, you know, marriage and sex and divorce, these are sensitive topics, but that's what Paul has to dive into here. And what he says is actually super helpful and encouraging for all of us, including the many singles among us. Because the verses we're about to look at will help all of us see and enjoy the gospel from new angles, through new lenses, through the lenses of new different problems. Um, these verses are also important for those singles among us who may one day get married in the future. You know, get your training in now, get learning for that now, make your future marriage even better. And these verses will also help the singles among us understand and love and be able to help married people and redeemers, some of whom might really be struggling. Um, I remember being told as a student um, who's struggling with singleness, you know, there's only one thing worse than being unhappily single, and that's being unhappily married. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but singles, you mustn't think that married people necessarily have it made. All that to say, all of the verses we're about to look at hold great riches for all of us, no matter what our status. And this passage basically divides into three areas. Verses 1 to 5 are about marriage and sex, 6 to 9 are about marriage and singleness, and then 10 to 17 are about marriage and divorce. So first, marriage and sex. Let me read the beginning of verse 1 again. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And that little phrase appears a few times in 1 Corinthians, and it signals Paul getting onto one of the new issues that they have raised with him. So he, he touches on a few different, you know, we talk meat sacrifice to idols, the resurrection, Sunday gatherings, whatever it might be. And this one is marriage and singleness. And then he goes on in verse 1. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but... Just notice that that's in speech marks, at least in English. There are no speech marks in Greek, uh, in biblical Greek, Koine Greek. The point being that it's something the Corinthians were saying, which he's just quoting. Big question, does he agree with them? And the equally big answer is no. They had got into thinking that not having sex was always necessarily better, somehow purer or something, even within marriage, which is something Paul disagrees with throughout this letter. He disagrees with it carefully and with nuance, but throughout this chapter, we're going to see Paul consistently standing up for the goodness of sex. And he does so in verse 2, 
verse 5, verse 9, verse 10, verse 28, and verse 36. The oldest fake news, the most unfair anti-Christian propaganda in the world is that God is anti-sex. He is not. He is very pro-sex. It's not dirty. It's not shameful. It's not embarrassing. It's healthy and beautiful and special. And that's the biblical view. Well, then in verses 2 to 5, Paul goes on to make four points relating to it. Sex within marriage. First, that sex with your spouse can be a great defence against temptation. Let me read verse 2. Because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, Corinth was awash with temptation to sexual immorality. It was a highly, highly sexualized place. Um, included a temple to the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite, in which all the priestesses were prostitutes, all 1,000 of them. And we might think, well, at least our society isn't quite like that. I'd say our society is arguably worse in terms of the pornography epidemic. In our world, pornography dominates the internet, which is the, just the air we breathe, even subconsciously. It sucks people into addiction, and it ends up costing them everything. And I've seen that play out multiple times. Well, all around the Christians in Corinth, similar, you know, the air they breathed, there was this kind of free love culture in which anything went, people slept with anything that moved, everyone had multiple sexual partners. And in verse 2, Paul is saying two things. You just look at verse 2. Number one, stick to God's wise design, one husband with one wife. And by the way, folks, you know, virtual partners still count. If you're fantasizing about anyone who isn't your spouse, um, whether they're on a screen or otherwise, or just in your imagination, you mustn't kid yourself. You are being unfaithful to your spouse. And in fact, you're guilty of adultery, according to Jesus, at least, in Matthew 5. So number one, stick to God's wise design, one husband with one wife. And under that point, I do want to be sensitive to you know any in our number who just have a different view of what marriage is. Um, we, we want to be biblical as a church, we respect your view. This is ours. And I hope you'll stick around to see that we, we want to be gentle and that we love you. And, you know, why not investigate this with us by looking with us at what we believe to be the word of God. But we do consider marriage to be one husband, one wife, even though that's unpopular at the moment. Um, and then number two in verse two, Paul is saying, make sure you're enjoying God's gift of sex, partly as defense against the temptation to immorality. As I once heard someone put it, if you can have steak at home, you're less likely to go out for fast food. So that's the, the first thing. And second, Paul affirms the equal sexual rights of both partners in a marriage. And this is in verse three. He says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, her rights to sex, and, like, and likewise the wife to her husband. And Paul's logic here is that the, the beautiful mutual submission, which characterizes all healthy Christian marriages, which he teaches elsewhere as well, um, is key. Verse four, he says, for, hear the logic there? For the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, likewise, this is totally reciprocal. The husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does have authority over his body. So, you know, not tonight, dear, I have a headache. It's okay to an extent, but all of us husbands and wives need to be so careful not to grow selfish. Um, otherwise, selfishness when it comes to whether or not we have sex with our partner can lead potentially to any one of three things. Number one, sex only ever happening when both partners happen to be up for it at the same time, which probably isn't enough. And number two, quiet resentment building up in whichever partner's being denied the most. And then number three, possibly more temptation for that partner to sin by going off and finding sexual satisfaction elsewhere, be it off a screen or um, in other ways. So we've got to be kind to each other in our marriages, Redeemer, and unselfish, and recognize that in marriage that we're, we're one unit. We no longer have the autonomous freedom which is enjoyed by those with the gift of singleness. We're going to get onto that in a minute. So husbands, let's, let's get um, practical here. If you happen to be the one in your marriage with a higher sex drive than your wife, this looks like you being sensitive in how much sex you're asking for. 
and being self-controlled and restrained and patient. Because your body isn't just yours, it's your wife's as well. And the same goes the other way. And, and this loving mutual submission applies not just to how much we have sex, but how we have sex as well. For example, it means husbands and wives being much more concerned with how to please their partner than just getting what they want for themselves. Again, for example, husbands. I'm a husband, so I'm going to speak to the husbands. If you find yourself you know, pressuring your wife to do something she's uncomfortable with physically, a bit like a toddler, you know, pestering her for a snack or something, you need to grow up and show some manly self-control and just be content because your body doesn't actually belong to you. Your body belongs to her. And the same the other way. And when both parties have that loving, patient, kind, unselfish, uh, mutual submission, recognizing they no longer belong to themselves, they belong to each other, let me tell you, that is a recipe for an incredibly fulfilling, joyful sex life. And just by the by, husbands, you may find that the more godly you are, when it comes to you know being restrained and patient despite wanting more sex, that that can also be the most productive approach for you. Well, then third, um, Paul highlights the option couples have of choosing to abstain from sex for a bit, and this is verse five. He says, "Do not deprive one another," and by that he doesn't mean that if you're ill or exhausted and your partner's selfishly badgering you for sex, you have to give it to them. No, by do not deprive one another, he means don't withhold sex from your partner as leverage, you know, to get revenge on them for something. Don't use it as a bribe or threat. Don't weaponize it. But then he goes on, verse 5, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So just like we might fast from food sometimes for spiritual reasons, and I hope we do, by the way, um, I do regularly. It was great to have that 24-hour fast for Redeemer at the start of last week. I was thrilled at how many of you emailed me or texted me to say you were doing it. But just like we might fast from food sometimes for spiritual reasons, so also it's not a bad thing for married couples to fast from sex for the same reasons. So as part of their devotion to prayer, maybe for a specific season or for a specific reason. Um, we won't go into the theology of fasting right now. Paul's just describing another type of fast right now connected to prayer. And then Paul's fourth and final point under this first section of sex and, and marriage and sex is to highlight the danger of Satan in the area of sex. Look at the end of verse 5. He says, but then come together again, you know, start having sex again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You see, because sexual desires and temptation could be so strong and the area of sex is so sensitive and so intense, all of that makes it a favourite and highly strategic hunting ground of Satan's. He knows if he can just spoil a couple's sex life, you know, take away its excitement and joy, or cause one or both of the couple to start sinning sexually, he's well on his way to driving a wedge between them, to really damaging their marriage. And if he can just damage their marriage, well, then the sky's the limit. You know, he can start screwing up their kids, stop their ministry at church, chip away at their personal faith, and so on. So beware, you know, as a married couple, your sex life is really worth guarding spiritually, both in prayer, I hope you're praying about it, and by being intentional with it and vigilant about it. Way too important to treat casually. Well, then Paul moves on from marriage and sex in verses 1 to 5 to marriage and singleness, and this is in verses 6 to 9, verse 6. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. And the this, by the way, refers back to him saying it's okay to stop having sex for short periods of time in verse 5. He's careful not to let down as a rule. He doesn't want to be legalistic. Reading on in verse 6. He says, I wish that all were as I myself am. In other words, single. Now, he's not saying that everyone should be single, and if you're not, you're second best. He's saying that singleness suits him. He's really content with it. It works for him beautifully, and that it has advantages that he wishes everyone could enjoy. Because then he goes on to affirm both singleness and marriage. Rest of verse 7. He says, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, one of another. Now, here's what one commentator helpfully says about this. Quote, singleness is as much a charisma, that's the Greek word for gift, by the way, 
as evangelism, or speaking in tongues, or the working of miracles. Paul says exactly the same about marriage. That too is a charisma. Paul is thus rehabilitating both celibacy and marriage as manifestations of the grace of God to be undertaken and to be sustained in the strength which the Lord daily supplies. So, just as married people shouldn't resent their status, because God is sovereign, their status has come about under his perfect providence, so in the same way single people shouldn't resent their status. You know, it may carry pain, it may carry frustration, but it is a gift of God. And as such, it does carry amazing opportunities, maybe things like character formation that you badly need that you wouldn't have had if you were married, or, or maybe f um, opportunities for spiritual things. And maybe you get to experience God or do things for God in a way that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to. Maybe practical things, you know, extra time, extra energy, more financial freedom. And as a gift of God, singleness does come accompanied by God's sustaining grace alongside it. Verse 6. To the unmarried and the widows, Paul goes on, and we, conclude, we can include widowers there, it is good for them to remain single as I am. He's saying, look, unless you have a good reason for needing to change, let your default just be that you stay as you are. Don't force it. You know, be content in your natural circumstances. Verse 9. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. He's saying, but here is a good reason to actively look hard for a godly Christian husband or wife. If your sexual urges are just so strong and you struggle to contain them, you think you're going to explode, well, then it's probably worth going and finding God's wonderful outlet for them. Now, over the years at Redeemer, I've seen multiple single people start dating and get engaged and get married. And um, Michelle sometimes has to sort of hold me back from being a matchmaker. Um, it's the old romantic in me. Um, and that is always amazing to watch, and I love seeing it. But let me say, I've also seen single people joyfully content in their singleness. And let me say, that is at least, at least as amazing to watch and at least as beautiful to see and fulfilling and noble and honourable. And then I've also seen single people who find it deeply painful, and that's very hard. Pray and fight hard for peace and contentment, whatever your status. Don't rule out accepting it as God's will, uh, will. But also don't rule out seeking a husband or wife if your sexual desires are constantly burning hot, to use the word Paul uses here, and, and you find that you struggle to focus or get on with life as a result. And, and both marriage and singleness are legitimate, wonderful gifts from a loving God who knows what each of us needs. Third and finally, Paul comes on to marriage and divorce, and this is now in verses 10 to 16. And here Paul speaks to couples whose marriages are really struggling. They're on the rocks. You know, some of the marriages he has in mind are Christian marriages, which are on the rocks and struggling, like in verse 10. And some of the marriages he has in mind are mixed, you know, where one partner is Christian, but the other isn't. And maybe either of those categories apply to some of you guys watching right now. Well, if so, the Bible has something very specific to say to you in a second. And Paul will then give two reasons for that principle. So first, what is the principle? What does he say to struggling marriages? Verse 10. To the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. In other words, he's saying that this isn't just advice now. This is the holy word of God. He's laying this heavily and deliberately so. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And it, the same as before, this is exactly reciprocal. This is fair. Reading on. And the husband should not divorce from his wife. Paul is saying, you stay together. Divorce is just not an option. It mustn't even be on the table. He's not ruling out therapeutic separation. For example, some temporary physical distance for the protection of a wife that's being abused. And um, I'm, I'm glad to have enabled that to happen um, in ministry in the past. But he is saying the same thing to both parties. You stay married, you work it out, you do not walk away. And of course, the implication there is that any marriage no matter how broken and painful it is, can be worked out. You know, I've seen miracles happen in Redeemer marriages over the years. 
But for them to be able to happen, both partners have to trust God and obey him by not splitting up. One Christian writer puts this point really well, quote, Paul's fundamental approach to the question of Christians getting divorced is very simple. Don't. The Lord has expressly forbidden it, so do not even allow yourselves the luxury of entertaining it as a possibility. If this is the express command of the Lord, it does no good whatsoever mentally to flirt with what is so clearly beyond limits. If, as this writer goes on, as not infrequently happens, a Christian couple think they've made a mistake in getting married, it is important for them to accept the authority of the Lord's teaching and to re-engage with their relationship in the conviction that if they work at it, God can make it new and living. In fact, so strong is this injunction for couples to stay together, it applies even to marriages in which one person is Christian but the other isn't. And that's the point of verses 12 and 13. And, and there Paul is saying, look, if your non-Christian spouse is willing to stay with you, despite the fact that you're now converted, or at least are now living out your faith in a way you weren't before, you stay with them. Now, I've never been in that position, so I don't know what it's like. I've had friends in that position. It must be so hard, so painful. I once heard about a marriage where the wife later became a Christian, and the husband, who was a surgeon, described the marriage in two ways. Number one, he said, she was no longer the person he'd fallen in love with and decided to marry. Now, how tough must, must that have been for her as well as for him? And then number two, he said it was like there was another man about the house to whom she was all the time referring her decisions and consulting for advice and instructions. He said he felt he was no longer the main man in his own house, that Jesus now set the tone and gave the orders. So like I say, you know, anyone watching this who is a Christian married to a non-Christian, that must be so hard. If that is you, my heart goes out to you. But unless your non-Christian partner decides otherwise, the Bible is saying to you this morning, trust God, obey God, you stay together. And this also applies, and you know, this is a very um, interesting application in my mind, and one that is very, very relevant over the years of ministry that I've had in Redeemer. Um, this applies to marriages where one partner is meant to be Christian. It's like officially Christian or publicly Christian, but maybe the wife almost doubts her husband's salvation, so selfish is he, or spiritually immature or unchristian in some of his actions, or, or the other way around, wife and husband. Um, if so, again, for the spouse that is living out their faith, listening to this, that must be so hard for you. Stay together. Keep working at it. And Paul gives two reasons. The first in verse 14, is that you, the, the Christian partner, may well be used, used by God to influence the non-Christian partner for the better, you know, to draw them into a relationship with God themselves. And we see Paul make that point in verse 16 as well, where he says, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? He's saying, look, it may be hard. You, you may be sparing that other person who you struggle to love or even like at times from eternal damnation. The second reason for a Christian staying with a non-Christian they married is also in verse 14, and it's the kids. If there are children, your status as a Christian is extended to them by God at least until they are old enough to have to answer for themselves spiritually, until they come of age. Um, you know, they're considered as part of the covenant community, even if just one of the parents, you, in their household is included in God's saving covenant. Plus, as they then grow up and are of an age where they have to take responsibility for themselves spiritually, you're probably the best hope they have of getting saved. So you stay in that home. And when they're little, you cover them under your wings of God's grace. And as they grow up, you be the best Christian mum or dad to them that you can be in hope that they too repent and believe for themselves. Well, we've covered lots of ground. Lots of it has been pretty sensitive. Um, if issues have been brought up in this message which you want to discuss more, please do not hesitate to get in touch with someone. Get in touch with your growth group leader or uh, an older, more mature um, Christian in the church you respect and trust or an elder or staff member. Um, in the first instance, I'd, I'd probably recommend you drop Dustin, our family's pastor, an email. I know he would want to help you and I can vouch for how incredibly uh, godly and wise and experienced he is and what an awesome marriage he has. Um, and if you've been helped or blessed in any way by this passage, 
you know, do let the elders or the staff team know. We love hearing from you. We appreciate the encouragements. And uh, you can do that by filling out the, the brand new online connection card we've just developed. There'll be a link to it in every video going forward. But whether your singleness is very hard, or your marriage does feel like a sentence as opposed to a word, or your husband does cook for you every night like you're a god by putting burnt offerings before you, let me finish now by reading a phrase from verse 7 one last time. It says this, Each has his own gift from God. Whatever your status, God is sovereign. God's perfect providence is working. There are great opportunities in your status. Your status is a gift. And God does supply the grace that each of us needs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. I pray they would bring about great hope, great happiness, great comfort and strength for many in Redeemer. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.